Hi, I'm Xinfeng Chen from Lubang Observatory Data Management Team. Uh, today, I'll talk a bit about our experience and the vision using cloud infrastructure for our Lubang Observatory Data Management Services. So first you might ask, why is Lubang Observatory? Never heard of it? Well, you might have heard of our old name, which was Rock Synoptic Survey Telescope or LSST. Around a year ago, we changed our name to be Berasi Ruben Observatory to honor Vera Ruben. A picture of her picture is shown on the right here, taken by our own camera. Vera Ruben was a female astronomer who did important scientific discovery in dark matter. We still keep the acronym LSST, but now it means Legacy Survey of Space and Time, which is the science survey will do in the first 10 years of operation. A bit more about our observatory. Rubin Observatory is a ground-based optical observatory based in Chile. We have an 8.4 meter primary mirror and a very wide field of view that's 9.6 square degree. We have a 3.2 gigapixel camera and we work in the optical band. On the left here is a picture taken in December 2020. So you can see that we are still in the construction phase, but we are getting ready to start science operation in late 2022. The science drivers behind the observatory is very wide. The four key science drivers include dark matter, dark energy, the structural information, the Milky Way, getting the complete inventory of the solar system, and exploring the optical transient sky. The idea is to get the vast astronomical data set that's going to be useful for many different areas in astrophysics. To do that, our main LSST survey or legacy survey of space and time will be scanning the four observable skies. So that's going to be half the sky that could be observable from the side in Chile. And we'll be able to scan the four sky every once every three to four nights. So in the end of the 10 year survey, for every location in the sky, we expect to have more than 800 images each. In terms of the number of objects after the 10 year survey, we expect to have around 20 billion of galaxies and 17 billion of stars in the catalog. So this data set is gonna be very useful for different kinds of science that um, for the community. So more about the data, here's an overview of our data management system. Every night, the telescope will take sequential images and that's going to be about 20 terabyte of data every night. This data will be transferred to our data asset center in the United States, and they will be processed right away to generate prompt data product. For anything that changes, for example, transient sources, variable sources, moving sources, alerts will be issued and published. So those alerts will be given out within 60 seconds after the shutter is closed, and they will be accessible through alert filtering service and community brokers. The rest of the prompt data product will be made available within the next 24 hours on our data asset centers. In the cadence of about once per year, we'll reprocess all the data up to a cutoff day and have a reconsistent uh, reprocessing that's consistent and have data releases. We expect to have a catalog of about 15 petabytes after the 10 year survey. All these data products will be made available in our data access centers. And we expect the data right holder not just have the data right, but they actually get access to our Ruben Science platform where they will uh, access these data products. So you could think of the science platform as a set of integrated web applications and services. So users could go onto the platform and access the data, subset the data, and do next to the data analysis of our beta products. 
the Ruben Science platform has three key aspects, the portal aspect, the noble aspect, and the web API aspect. All these aspects are supported by a shared backend service that include on data releases, error filtering service, database and files that not just hold the data products, but also allow users to spare their own catalogs in the user database or their own user files in the user uh, file service. We also expect to allow the user to be able to use compute resources to run their own jobs. So they could use the compute resources in the data asset center to run more analysis. And of course, on the science platform, make available is a, a suite of software tools. These include all the software that we use to make the data releases. And if the, so, the users want to install their favorite software, they could do so too for the, on the science platform. So more into each aspect of the science platform. For the portal aspect, it's an environment for the users to be able to do some exploratory analysis. For example, the users could browse the catalogs, the user could display an image, maybe subset the catalog, um, maybe overlay the detection on top of an image, like it's shown on the right image here. The users could also make products from using the data in this data uh, archive and they, they can make their own products in the interface. If the portal aspect is not enough, the users might want to go to the noble aspect. So this is a Jupyter Lab environment. The users could bring their own Python notebook and do their own um, processing or own analysis on the platform. The Jupyter Lab environment also has the terminal shared assets. So one could also use the the command line interface instead of the, besides the Python notebook. So we expect that users don't have to download the data to their home computer or on their own site. They could just bring their code to the data and do the analysis inside the science platform. We expect to be able to let the user to be able to have some of their batch jobs maybe through the Python interface or through the command line interface, but they will be able to use more compute, um, like a lot more compute that's accessible from the data asset centers. So the users could make their own user-generated data products on top of our provided data products. So they could add values to the data products. Another aspect of the science platform is the web API assets that will allow remote access through standardized APIs to get this data. And we're gonna follow IBOA protocols as much as possible. For example, on the right here is an example of Topcat connecting to the data archive um, so that how to access the data through the web APIs. So this allows extra integration to be possible and with the external tools. So the science platform is gonna be hosted somewhere, right? And in our concept of operations, we are gonna have a United States data facility or USDF to be the main host of these hardware that have the, all the services being deployed and do the data processing. We don't envision this is gonna be one single data facility. We actually think there are gonna be multiple data facilities around the world. For example, our French collaborator at CCIM 2P3 will have French data facility and they will help us with around half of the annual data release processing. There are more in discussions to have independent data access center around the world and they might stand up their own science platform. They might have the full data full set of data products, or maybe a subset of the data products to serve those data to the users. One biggest uncertainty for the Ruben team in the last few years was that we actually didn't know where exactly our US data facility was going to be. That brought a lot of uncertainties, 
us, for example, we wouldn't want to buy hardware when we didn't know where the eventual US data facility was going to be. But meanwhile, since 2018, the Ruben team started to collaborate with commercial cloud providers, including Google Cloud and Amazon Web Services to have some proof of concept projects to see how we could bring our data management services to the cloud. So we want to see like if we could simply deploy our services on the cloud, deploy our uh, software on the cloud, as well as we want to see how that works, how surprising, um, whether there's some adjustment we might do to our system to make things work better on the cloud. Many of our services are deployable on Kubernetes. For example, the Ruben Science Platform I just mentioned earlier is totally based on Kubernetes. So instead of having our own in-house Kubernetes cluster, we could use the Kubernetes services from the cloud provider and deploy our science platform there. We also try to deploy QServe, which is our own distributed database service for large scale data products. And we want to make sure that the performance on the cloud is just as good as those that we have on-premise cluster. In our proof of concept project, we also tested data transfer to make sure that the networking speed would be fast enough to catch up with the processing. Another big part of our proof of concept project was to test our data release processing. So this is a batch style processing. We use HT Condor and Pegasus in our proof of concept project and could demonstrate that how things work on the cloud environment. So I'll talk more about that in a little bit. So as we were wrapping up our cloud proof of concept project, the Ruger team management decided to go with the cloud provider as our interim data facility. It was mostly motivated by the delay of our US data facility decision as when we didn't know where it was going to be. And cloud hosting seemed to be the best option as it gave us a lot of flexibility. And meanwhile, we could start to ramp up our pre-operational activity using those standards interfaces on the cloud. So now we have a contract with the Google Cloud. In the next three years, Google Cloud Platform is our interim data facility, and we are going to do our pre-operational activities on Google Cloud. We have started to migrate some of our data services to the Google Cloud. And right now, we are planning of some data previews exercises to be on the Google Cloud. In the next few years, we, when we are doing these pre-operational activities, that is before the actual science operations, we are going to have three data preview releases using uh, data that's before the actual science operations. So the first one, or what we call the data preview zero, we are going to use simulated data, but later, when the CAMCAM or commissioning camera data become available, we'll serve them on the cloud interim data facility as well. And then after that, when the actual LSSD, cam, LSSD camera big data become available, we will do the data preview too to serve those to our commissioning team as well as community. So having Interim data facility provide us the chance to be able to do some early integration test of our system, let the team be able to get uh, more ready for the operations. And meanwhile, these, we are gonna work on community users to be on our platform. So that hopefully could benefit the community users as well as we let them to be able to more familiar with our Ruben data products and our data services. And of course, eventually we'll have to transition into the eventual side of US data facility and ramp up the full science operation in late 2022. More on our um, plan for the next year, which is data preview zero and the interim data facility on Google Cloud, 
we are starting to deploy the science platform on the Google Cloud, and we will start small and uh, gradually ramp up through the pre-operations phase. In 2021, we plan to welcome around 300 community users to be on our platform to use these services. We are gonna serve the simulated LSST data provided to us by Dark Energy Science co Collaborations. As you see on the images here, it, they provided us a 300 square degree coverage of data that's five year depth of data. So that's gonna give an idea of how these data products are gonna be in when we come go to the actual science uh, operations. We may not be able to, we might not be able to deploy everything on day one or have everything ready on day one, but that's the point. We are gonna start small. Maybe we'll just have things in the minimum services, do the best effort as we could, but we will ramp up as they go. For example, in the beginning, we will not have the user batch compute. We will not be able to let the users to submit jobs in on day one. But as services become ready, we'll bring that into the cloud provider and to the cloud infrastructure and serve that to our users. So behind the front end of the science platform, we do also have to do the data release processing to get this data to be science ready, have the data releases. So these are batch style processing. And so in the next part of my talk, I would talk a bit more about the details of what we did in our proof of concept project for this batch processing. After the 10 years of Ruben uh, legacy survey of space and time, we expect to have around 60 petabytes of raw input data. This raw input data will be processed by our science pipelines and made into about 500 petabytes of data products. So these data products are things like co-edited images, uh, the object catalogs, including sun analysis. So that's hopefully science ready and for the, the scientists to do the new discoveries there. That's a lot of data and um, we started small in our proof of concept project. We just use a much smaller set of 1.5 terabyte of data as input that were made into about 10 terabytes of output data. You might feel like that sounds small, but just for that, that's more than 10, uh, sorry, more than 100,000 jobs in between. So that's a lot of processing. We use HT Condor and Pegasus to help us with the workflow for the science pipeline. So HT Condor and Pegasus be able to help us managing the interdependencies between jobs. And for example, they also be able to recover from transient failures and be able to say automatically retry failed jobs. And on the cloud platforms, we were able to take advantage of cheaper compute options. For example, on AWS, that they have the spot instances. And on Google Cloud Platform, we have the printable VMs. So that's these cheaper compute options that we could use for these large, uh, large scale batch style workflow. In our science pipeline software design, our science pipelines do not write the files directly. Instead, we have an extract layer named data butter that extracts away these data assets. For example, for uh, science pipeline developers, they just get the Python objects. They don't have to worry about where exactly the files are stored, what's the file formats in, in the file system. Uh, they just have to focus on the scientific algorithms in their science pipelines. This data butter abstract layer has two components, the data store and the registry. They both have pluggable backends that could be really flexible. While we were on-premise, we only had one implementation of the data store, which was the file system. That's what that's all we had at the time, but when we moved to the cloud, 
we implemented the object store backend for the Butler data store. So instead of the file system, you could use, for example, Amazon S3 data store, S3 object store as the Butler data store. Similarly, we could also use the Google Cloud storage for um, with the S3 interface as the Butler data store. So this data store basically uh, the, is the place where files are actually stored on um, that host the data. The registry is technically a Postgres database and we store more um, information about the data uh, including, for example, provenance of this data and some of the processing and it allows us to, for example, label and tag some of the data. On the cloud, we could use managed services for the database, for example, on Amazon, the relational database services, and on Google Cloud, the Cloud SQL provides us a way to easily have a database instance and that's ready for us to use for our compute jobs. So here's a picture of our overall architecture that we used in our proof of concept projects on Google Cloud for the batch processing. So on the right is the storage I mentioned about this data butler has the data store on the object store and the registry that's a Postgres database. On the left in the middle is the HC condo cluster. For that, we use Terraform infrastructure as code tool to deploy and provision and manage this HT condo cluster on the Google Cloud. So for example, I could have some machine readable definition files on my laptop and with some simple command, I could ask Terraform to deploy a HT condo cluster on the Google Cloud and then it would just be done in a very easy and fast way. And I wouldn't have to, for example, go to the Google Cloud console to manually click through things and set things up in the interactive way. So that automation is very helpful to be able to deploy the infrastructure in a repeatable way uh, and without human errors. And of course, there's also other benefits such as you could version control these um, infrastructure as code. We use HT Condor to help us managing the workflow and workload and also the resources. HT Condor see what jobs need to be run in my workflow. It look for what resources are available and then it do the matching and then run my job and my workflow on the resources for me. For the Condor pool, that's basically a pool of workers that do the actual execution. The account report on the Google Cloud could be supported by the managed instant group. That's a Google Cloud feature. So these Google Cloud managed instant group could be auto scaled up and down according to the demand on the cluster. For example, if there are more jobs, then the cluster is scaled up. So the jobs could be done faster in clock time. But if some machine on left idle, for example, I have a workflow that has a bottleneck, I'm waiting for this big job and nothing else could be wrong at the moment. And instead of letting the machines being idle, they could just be turned down and the whole cluster is scaled down. So I don't waste money on idle machines. So on Google Cloud, we also take advantage of operational tools, for example, Google Logging or Secret Managers to help us, for example, say manage password in a secure way or be able to have an integrated interface to look for the logs and for troubleshooting and other purposes. So some takeaways from these proof of concept cloud um, exercise. Um, on the cloud, the compute and storage give us a lot of flexibility the storage feels like it has unlimited storage capacity as long as I'm willing to put data there and of course pay for it. It has the space for me. It gives a lot of flexibility. When we were on-premise, 
it seems like we have to have this one generic environment that kind of works for different components of the team of the big system. But instead, we could for each system to be having more customized environments, more suitable, more optimized for individual need. Also, using infrastructure as core tools is very helpful in managing and provisioning the resources. That's a lot faster, and then you could do things in a consistent way, and you could do so in a repeatable way. Of course, some of that could be done on premise as well. And just when we move to the cloud, we started to think more about how can we improve and make everything more repeatable and like in a better manner. We take advantage of the monitoring and logging tools integrated on the cloud environment to help us troubleshooting and for example, um, also monitoring how, much, how many jobs are pending in my job queue and also use that to auto scale the cluster. So that bring me to the really nice feature for auto scaling that we used in our project that uh, scale the cluster up when we have more demand. So we could, for example, be able to burst and run as wide as possible while we could, so we could get everything done in a shorter clock time. And of course, the whole costing model is very different. And similarly, the service model is a little different on the cloud. I guess we are more using self-service rather than having a dedicated team that's in charge of the dedicated cluster. So, as I mentioned that we are in the beginning of our three year journey on the Google Cloud for our interim data facility. We are very proud that we are one of the first astronomical projects that use cloud infrastructure at this scale. And I'm sure that as we go along with our interim data facility, we are gonna learn a lot more about how to do this on the cloud. And we'll be happy to share more with the community. So with that, thank you very much and I could take questions.